Okay, welcome back to the Cult Emporium. And uh, last week we were taking a look at to the first part of Flux, but since then we've had part two, haven't we, Mr. Philip Beeman? Indeed, uh, uh, another exciting instalment. I think we can both agree. Oh, absolutely! I thought it, it just gets better and better. Um, I thought the first one was pretty good, but this one seemed to really pick up from that and uh, raise it to and, a, 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 the next level. Yeah, and the return and I would say re- restoration of, of an old foe uh, in uh, in War of the Sontarans. Indeed, indeed, they were they were due a makeover and a bit of attention, weren't they, the Sontarans? I'm not entirely sure they were as dark as I wanted them to be, but um, but they were certainly well presented. I'm not I'm not knocking it at all. I mean, I, I we we got to see them, you know, brutally murdering some some scousers, which you know, is, which is something I, I think you have to you always walk a really fine line with the song parents because they've always been a bit comedic you know that's baked into the the robert holmes premise and they do look like potatoes and i think they found the right balance because they were still fearful i think i think you've got some of them i think that the, the the some of the troops are like cannon fodder and then you've got the commanders that are that are the more intelligent clones that, that are kind of a bit more fearsome oh a bit like the world wars yeah exactly yeah <laughs> No, I, I, I'm not knocking it. They, they were well presented. I just, I just would have liked to have taken them that stage further into a kind of a darker persona, but could, because obviously they're, they're they're used as the, the the comic foil sometimes, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I thought I thought it was really, um, I thought I thought they were really utilised well, and it was the perfect setting for the Sontarans because that. Um, British imperialism, imperialist attitude is, is, the, is the Sontarans, isn't it, in a way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're kind of encapsulated in the character, aren't they? Yeah. So should we go through uh, the plot as it was? Yes, indeed, because we, we had all the, uh, the Crimean War stuff um, right. with Mary Seacole, which I think was very, very well done. And you had the Colonel Blimp character, didn't you, who was... Uh, yeah. Now, now, Mary Mary Seacole has uh, some significance for me because um, I, I used to go to the University of Salford, and uh, we had a building named after her, the, which was the Faculty of um, Health and Social Care. So, so I oh. sort of I know, know that name, but to my shame, I didn't know much about her her background. But, but uh, having having since done my research today, I've, I've found you know what a, what a fascinating. Um, a, 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 fasc- a fascinating woman that that you know really is perhaps an an, an unsung voice in uh, in our history, isn't she? Yeah, well, I, d- I admit I didn't know much about her either, uh, and so you know this is one of the great things about Doctor Who—it educates us all, doesn't it? To these uh, moments in history that we're perhaps a little unfamiliar with, and and shines a little light on them. Yeah, I- Chibnall's been really good at doing that, actually, like picking. So somewhat obscure figures from history and then and then you know you go back and have a have a look at, at what they've done you're like wow one thing i wanted to say which we didn't touch on last week was how great the uh regulars are um jody whittaker and mandip gill uh, and and the new regular john bishop because um they're really giving really strong performances aren't they uh jody and, and mandip are, yeah uh, Man- Mandip in, in particular this this week in her in her storyline you just see the growth of Yaz how she's become this seasoned time traveller and yes she is phased for a moment being transported to to the planet time um, but she you know she she like throws herself in with with great with great aplomb and I, I think her character arc as as or her internal I think sometimes Yaz has been underwritten but Mandip has always been been fabulous and been playing these. These these notes in the in the background, I think. Well, I suppose that's that's one thing of having one less character of this TARDIS crew is that there's time to concentrate a little bit more on on those that are, are left there. Yeah. And and Mandip has uh, got the benefit of this, I think, and and I hope that will be that will be developed over the next few episodes. Yeah. So uh, so um, very quickly. So after we've our new TARDIS team was formed last week. Uh, just as quickly they've all been separated which was which was a bit you know a bit of a a bit of a MacGuffin because they've been exposed to the time vortex so they got 
scattered but we'll, we'll get we'll go with it because uh, you know because it because it was it was played well um so dan returns to liverpool uh which has a bit of a santarin infestation doesn't it doesn't it and 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 uh and we'll talk about this in a moment yaz goes to the planet time but what did you think of um of, of dan's uh Dan's uh, parents in, in Liverpool. They were great because they were straight from Brookside, weren't they, basically? And, <laughs> you know, it, it, we need these characters to ground us to where we're, you know, an entry point for us uh, in, in all this fantastic yeah. stuff. And I, I think they work really, really well, actually. I, I, I hope that we see a bit more of them. Yeah, and and the fact that somebody um, had discovered that you could hit the the, the Santarans on on the back of the neck with with a with a walk was just, yeah. <laughs> it was, just it was just brilliant and and speaks to uh, the 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 Liverpudlian spirit, I think. Definitely, I I, I think there's a, there's mileage. They've got legs. Those characters. We we need to see them again. Yeah, and and also it was great the the way that it used the city again. You know, with um, with the the history of, of shipbuilding. Um, having them now building Santarin spaceships seemed entirely appropriate. Definitely. I, it, it's rather nice under Chris Chibnall that and everything hasn't been London-based. You know, it, it's uh, we've seen very little of the capital, really, in his reign, and, and that can only be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, he's still still doing, very much doing the postcard Britain thing that, that Russell was doing, but... He's, you know, he's doing other other locales, which is which is great. It's it's a bit more regional, which is which is always. always and I like great. that. I like that. Um. So. Uh, so uh, should we? If we if we return back to the the crime Crimean War, um, I th- I thought the the main plot of this was was actually quite well well contained the 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 where where she asks the doctor asks mary c cole to make observations about mm. the santarans and i thought the the resolution where you know whereby do you notice that is it was it every seven minutes every so many hours or something yeah like every that? 29 hours they always they get seven minutes downtime or to recharge or something yeah. something like I, that I yeah thinking, Poor, poor love, because she must have been, you know, she must have really needed a wee by if she'd been. Sat there, you know, 29 <laughs> oh, hours. she just has a squat where <laughs> she is. Nobody's looking. Uh, but, but I thought that was that was a really good, you know, um, nuts and bolts plotting, and that and that and that worked. That was that was just a good, clear cut. There was no no MacGuffin. It was something that was that was that was you know built into the story and I, I i really liked that it was you know there's all these other complicated plot bits going on but i thought that the dispatch of the santarans was was a smart move yeah yeah absolutely and, and i just wanted to say as well um because i didn't this is another character we didn't uh touch on and i know we're talking about the um crimea at the moment but also we didn't touch on last week about the carvinista himself who I think is wonderful, played by Craig Ells, I believe, and yeah. um, I, I think he's he's a wonderful, warm character in there that we kind of, of, of are coming to really like. I don't know what you think. Yeah, I, I, I do. I mean, there are, occasionally I keep wondering: Is Christopher Eccleston playing this character? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think no, I think it is brilliant, and I, I love the fact that Dan never thanks him. <laughs> There's yeah. there is a little moment at the at the end where where they sort of look at each other and, and, uh, you know, and, and you can, you can see that there is some kind of affection there. Um, and it's, and it's just the moments when he becomes a dog, like when they go through the waste tube at the end and then he shakes himself. Yeah. Lovely moments like that. Yeah. It's a really nice character and, and hopefully one we'll see more of. And I, I have a feeling that the relationship with Dammit is going to develop as time goes on between those yeah. two. There are real, a, you know, great invention, and I wouldn't be surprised in the way that you know the Jadoon have, have come back and the Sladeen came back in Sarah Jane Adventures. That that we see this race, uh, you know, in in the future, that there'll be something that will get integrated into the the wider Doctor Who universe. They might not have a whole story about them, but I can just see them popping up from time to time, can't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, I certainly hope so. Anyway, because it, it's he's so far he's been great fun as Carvin Easter. Yeah, and uh, the uh, the swarm himself. Uh, now, what's going on there? 
with his sister. I call them Riff Raff and Magenta after the Rocky <laughs> Horror Show. <laughs> because I don't know why, he just reminds me of oh, most beautiful sister. Um, well, I have to say, you know, what a wonderful performance from um, from both of them. Um, so and, and what I like about the guy is it's Sam Spruill, I think his name is, who, who plays the Swarm, is he he just goes so far without going way over the top. And, and it, 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 might, it makes it, re, you know, really chilling. He just knows how far to take it without, you know, because it could in that role, he could, you know, go go large. And he's, he's reining it in, and I think that's all the better for the drama. Yeah, and uh, and uh, Rishenda um, Sand- Sandal, yeah, who um, uh, who was, you know, who we thought we were going to be seeing in human form from all the publicity photographs that were that were released, and she's mm-hmm. she's uh, Line of Duty, isn't she? And she's in Criminal United Kingdom on Netflix, and she's mm-hmm. I thought I thought she I thought she's she's great as well, and they're both just having a, a lot of you know, a lot of fun in those parts and, and, and genuinely chilling, I, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying about the both of them. They're bringing this real um, terror to that to those scenes on the uh, the Temple of Atropos, mm. I think you said. Um, one of my friends, so we were introduced as well to the, the passenger as well. So one, and one of my friends drew, drew a parallels to the three Kryptonian villains from Superman 2. Mm. And you certainly got that at the end when they were, when they were sort of standing there. You've certainly got that, that visual now that they're a, a triumvirate. Although, of course, the passenger is, is mute. Yes. Yeah. We, we don't, I, I presume that maybe they'll be integrated more at some stage. Mm. We'll find out exactly who that is. Who that is? It may, you know, maybe it's a character that we we already know. Maybe there'll be some mm. you know, timey wimey th- stuff going on, and it could be the Doctor or something. Who knows? We'll just call him Lurch for now. Lurch, yeah, yes. Um, I have. Who else is there? Uh, we've mentioned the. Uh, we've got the chap that's digging the tunnels in Liverpool. Oh, that's so. right. Yeah, yeah. There's also there, and just and just seemed to walk off, and just just said, you know, the the boundaries are, are falling, and he, uh, you know, and Yaz tried to bring him into the adventure, and he just wandered off. I think he was just put there to remind us he's still about, because obviously one of these episodes is going to centre on on the Liverpool in 1820. So there is these sort of labyrinth tunnels under, you know, being dug under Liverpool, and then. There, there are also labyrinth tunnels on this spaceship, so I wondered if maybe they're somehow interconnected, or maybe a ba- you know, yeah. maybe you'd be able to cross into Liverpool through those tunnels. I don't know. Well, we'll find out. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, all, all, all told, it's it, it was a wonderful hour of television. I think. Um, yeah. Not not as frantic as last week, but that's to the good, really, because. You know, it's it spends more time getting to know these characters. Yeah, it it's, uh, it felt like there was, uh, you know, a degree of resolution. Like we actually, we we le- we learned something. There was there was some closure because because the Santarans were taking advantage of the flocks, and we you know we dispatched the Santarans, and then and then we had a cliffhanger that got us excited for next week. So I thought it was it was you know going forward. I reckon this will be the kind of the way it's weighted that the that we'll, we'll get we'll get a self-contained story or a story that gets wrapped up and then we'll get some more threads for the for the larger picture i am loving the cliffhanger though yes i mean we, we've yeah, been right. denied a lot of cliffhangers over the years haven't we We're with standalone stories all the time now did you hear the swarm did swarm actually click did we well i thought i did hear the click yes yeah but, okay, but so. as we know with Doctor Who, when you go when you re-edit and come back in next time, things don't always see, <laughs> appear like they did at the, on the cliffhanger. Yeah, I mean, if you watch you if you watch some of the 1960s episodes where you know they've refilmed the yeah. the beginning of the next episode, it's completely different. Yeah, or or um, my my favourite is Mark of the Rani, appropriately enough, um, where where George Stevenson just appears from no, like he wasn't there. That's the right. Was going to fall into that well. And into that, into that <laughs> wasn't even part of the equation, was he? Yeah, but then and then but then George Stevenson notices him from across the forest and comes and pushes you know pushes the thing over the top. So yeah, there's a, so it could very well, very well be that, but I don't I don't I don't see them doing that. 
you know. Well, it's all to play for anyway with next week's episode, which is Once Upon Time. And uh, we've got, we've saw a few Cybermen in there in the uh, little trailer. Yeah. I'm yeah. wondering whether the Cybermen might be more of a cameo. Yeah. You think they're going I to mean, be essential to the prot or not? It, it, it could it could be that a similar setup to the Sontarans that they're just taking advantage of the of the situation, and they mm. could be dispatched really quickly because we also saw a weeping angel in the trailer. So. So I think you're right. I think they're just going. To, I think it will be a cameo. We'll get some cool stuff with them and justify the expenditure of uh, building the new suits last series, <laughs> and then and then they'll get they'll get wiped out quickly. But the quality is it, this season is great, isn't it? In terms of the visuals, in terms of the scripts, in terms of the the guest characters and actors, it's all really high. I think this is the series that I expected from. The writer of Broadchurch. This is what Chris Chibnall does. He does these big, you know, big serialized event television. And not that I haven't enjoyed his previous series, but this just feels more in his wheelhouse. Yeah. It feels, you know, it feels big and over the top. And, and maybe, this, maybe just having six episodes in this run yeah. makes it more manageable for him. And he, 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 he kind of feels more comfortable with that shorter format. Yeah, I mean this. This reminds me a bit of his Torchwood finale, which had every, you know for series one, which had everything in the in the kitchen sink and just was was just mad was just m madness. Um, and um, for better or worse, you know, yeah, this is this is cometh the man, cometh the, the moment. Is that the phrase? Yeah, yeah. Chris Chibnall, he's doing good work. Yes, we're very much enjoying it. So. Um... We'll find out, no doubt, more of the plot will be unraveled to us next week. How exciting. At 6.30, an hour, a uh, uh, quarter of an hour later, isn't it? Yeah. Next week. We'll be there. Uh, so we've just been talking about the, we've just been talking about the Sontarans, or the uh, the Sontarans, as uh, Donna Noble would say. We have. Um, so I thought we'd take a moment where we'll, we'll do any other reading. For those that might not be versed in the entirety of Doctor Who, uh, do you have any uh, recommendations for uh, for people that might want to see more of the Sontarans? Do I have any, rec recommendations? Do you have any recommendations? Well, What's of course. Question? They might well check out, um, I don't know if it's on YouTube or what, Shakedown, The Return of the Sontarans. That was mine! <laughs> that was, strangely enough, that was, that was, that was mine. Uh, but, but go, go on, An independent film, which was made in 1994. I was there on the HMS Belfast, making sandwiches and stuff for them uh, in the background, uh, when because we had a lot of divas in Caroline Ford and... Uh, Sophie Aldred and um, Jan Chappelle, and there was Brian Croucher, I think, wasn't there? And some others, Michael Wisher, I think, was involved. Wisher, but yeah, yeah, I mean, but yeah, I mean, a great, uh, a great independent production financed uh, partly by uh, Dreamwatch magazine or DWB, whichever, which I was doing a little bit of writing for at the time. And I have um, fond memories of that. And I've just picked, yeah. plucked that out of thin air, and, and you'd already it prepared it. It was a great. It was a great Terence Dix script. Um, in fact, uh, that weirdly enough, that has actually become official Doctor Who canon because he then novelised it. He, yeah, he, he because he novelised it. He turned oh. it into a Doctor Who novel, where basically he took he took Shakedown the store the story and then made that the centre of the novel and then wrapped it and then wrapped the Doctor around. So it was released under the Virgin New Adventures line, ah. and it had this story about Captain Lisa Duran. Um, and a tiger moth spaceship being invaded by Sontarans, but then, but then he put the Seventh Doctor either side of it. So. Oh, well, that's interesting. I, I, I vaguely remember there being a novel, but although I, I don't think I've ever sit physically seen a copy of it. Yeah, but it, I mean, I do hope. I think the thing is that it was uh, Mark Gatiss was was the composer on it, and was 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 I think a producer as well. And I think that he's always said that he just wants to do it justice. That there might be some rights issues as well, but I think he right. just wants. Do it. He just wants to do the thing justice, and he's he's always busy, isn't he? Because he's yeah. doing sound mixes on Blu-rays. But it would be nice if one day we do get to see it because I think it does that thing with the Sontarans really well, where it gets the the balance of, of comedy and 
and Menace Wright, and and it and it speaks to an era where we were starved of Doctor Who. Um, so my recommendation would be that sometimes um, you have to see how far we've come. Um, so I'm going to recommend. It's not the greatest, but I'm going to recommend the Two Doctors because uh, it's it's an example, a rare example. Now now we're used to location filming all the time. We're always going to South Africa or. Uh, or Australia, uh, but it was a rare thing. So, so the two two doctors was uh, was um, trying to capitalise on the success of the five doctors, I think. And, and ba- basically, it was a multi doctor story, but it wasn't attached to any anniversary. Uh, they brought back the legend legendary. It, it was. It was. It was the twenty first anniversary. Well, that's not an anniversary. Well, it, it kind of is because you you can say the twentieth is, but you could also say the tw- the twenty first. Coming of age, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, then, anyway, it's it's an it's an interesting Robert Holmes script. I mean, he, it's it's too too long. Um, you know, Robert Holmes is the one that hated writing six parters, so of course they give him a, a three forty five minutes, which is the equivalent of a six parter. The Santarans, who are supposed to be sort of squat and, and short, are both. Co- are both played by really tall actors and they're supposed to be cl- a clone race and yet they both look distinctly different um but it's just it's just a bit a bit of a f- bit of fun and it's also it's it's just interesting to see like you know how how far we've come and that and that sometimes we um we put classic who on a pedestal and we really shouldn't do that so yeah camp fun so uh, what's going on in merch corner then rob well Merch Corner, my dear. Um, this, I want to mention the latest TARDIS, which is issued by the Doctor Who Appreciation Society. And it's wonderful magazine and it got lots of fabulous colour articles and stuff in. And the reason I want to mention it is because um, as much as we love good old Doctor Who magazine, it can sometimes feel like one big promotional tool for CDs or videos or even, you know, like press releases for the series and stuff. We, we get the feeling that we're on a kind of treadmill sometimes there. But with this, it, it feels much more fan orientated, much more celebratory, if you like. Maybe the fact that there's only one once in a while makes it feel like that. But uh, And it's got um, great articles. I mean, just one about... Doctor Who in Germany it takes you through the history of, of the programme and, and how it's been celebrated in, in Germany. Um, and there's a an interview with Terence Dix, uh, just try, leafing through, you know, all sorts. And, and Don Horton, who wrote The Inferno, a piece by Louise Jameson there. And perhaps most touchingly, and, and uh, I don't... I, can't see, uh, see how this was ever planned. Um, it's got an interview, uh, probably the last interview with Bob Baker in there. And that's only just come out. And of course, we lost Bob Baker this week, didn't we? Yeah, uh, Bob Baker, who, um, well, what was his first uh, story on Doctor Who? Uh, who with, with uh, In his partnership with Dave Martin, um, what was what was his first story? Was it The, was it the Three Doctors? Was it uh, or was the one before that? Can't remember. I'd have to look it up. But anyway, anyway certainly, the certainly they uh, they handled the first multi doctor story. Uh, they the also oh Blue they gave us axons as well. Yeah, they were known as the the Bristol Boys, weren't they? The Bristol they Boys, a, a safe pair of hands that uh, that Terence Sticks would would always go to. Um, and then they gave us another enduring creation in K nine. K nine. Yep, absolutely. Uh, And that brings me to my second piece of merch, because released this week has been the uh, Doctor Who audio annual, the K9 Doctor Who audio annual. Now, as you may be aware, those 1970s Doctor Who, Dalek and K9 annual, they, uh, they had fiction stories in there, short stories, and these have been serialized now on several cds uh, and read by actors co- to connected to the series and um, in the in the canine audio annual we've got dan starkey reading one now what i didn't know until i listened to it was that dan starkey does an absolutely terrific tom baker you know oh, worthy right. of john colshaw really good uh, and um, john leeson of course who is canine as we all know he reads some bonnie langford 
And we love Bonnie here. We love Bonnie. And and it, we're starting the campaign for the Mel Bush Adventures. Because where, where's K9 got to go now? Now Sarah's gone. It's the Mel Bush Adventures. And so, you know, we get a, we get a little taste of that because um, Bonnie reads a couple of stories and, and um, John Leeson does K9. So I love a bit of Bush. Love yeah, we Bush. love a bit of Melanie's Bush, Chef. Yes. Uh, oh, and Jeffrey Beavers reads one, The Master. Ooh. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that's well worth getting. I, I re I'm really liking. I've, I've listened to the Dalek ones, and we've, there's been, I think, two uh, volumes of, of the Doctor Who audio annual uh, from the, the, the long range of Doctor Who annuals as well. And um, they've all been terrific, really. Really, really good bedtime listening. Excellent. Um, so, uh, so that's the. So, what's that? The K nine. The K nine audio annual, K9 available audio from uh, BBC Worldwide and Audible. So and yeah, we, and we salute you, uh, Bob Baker. Um, oh, absolutely! I mean, a, a legend as a writer, not just to do with Doctor Who, but he's written so many things. You know, shoestring Bergerac. You know, lots of stuff over the years. Listen, Gromit. Wallace and Gromit, yes, but perhaps probably the most famous thing he's ever done, Wallace and Gromit. And so, still working up until the end of his life, he's still doing the odd bit of canine spin-off and uh, and and consulting on uh, on, on some uh, Doctor Who merchandise and what have you. Yeah, it's just a pity he never managed to get his um, canine and Omega movie off the ground because that was one of his pet projects, wasn't it? You know, through the past few years. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we salute you, Bob Baker. Uh, so do you have any any other business for this week? Well, no, not really. Um, I haven't seen... I'm, if we're talking about cult TV, which we, we are, I think um, the return of Dexter falls into that uh, category. And I know the first episode of uh, Dexter... New Blood went out this week, and I'm I'm a massive fan of Dexter, so I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing that. And I'd like to recommend, um, if you get a chance to go to the cinema, because um, it really does need to be seen on the big screen, uh, Denis Villeneuve's um, adaptation, Frank Herbert's Dune. Uh, there was a 1984 movie that was directed by David Lynch, which I have a, a fondness for, uh, but isn't really a, a good movie by any metric. But this this new version is just is absolutely stunning. It's a visual spectacle. So many performances, uh, interesting performances. A personal favourite of mine being uh, Stellan Skarsgård, um, who's completely unrecognisable as the as the hideous emperor. Um, and it's done really well at the box office. It's you know a two hour and a half movie uh, that ends on a cliffhanger. Um, that's slow, ponderous sci-fi, yet people have been lapping it up, which has, has cheered me up no end that there's still a market for that kind of sci-fi storytelling. So June 2021 is uh, is a thumbs up from me. Great. I shall check it out at some point. I'll add it to the list of all the things I've got to watch and, and probably never will do. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's we, we can wrap it up this week because we've we've covered all the things we need to cover. But uh, yes, it's exciting times for Doctor Who. I feel, I, I feel there's a buzz in the air again. What do you think? Yeah, de definitely. Um, just going going on Twitter, um, everybody. I mean, I try to avoid avoid Twitter. Um, it's not a healthy place to to spend a lot of time. But actually, uh, the buzz has all been very very positive. Just people are excited to be a Doctor Who fan again, and this shows the appeal of of serialized storytelling and doing the weekly the weekly drops. I mean Disney did it with the Mandalorian, didn't they? Yeah. And sometimes it is, you know, we live in this box set culture, but I'm actually quite glad that we're getting flux once a week because we all get to talk about it and speculate. We've gone old things. school, haven't we? That's what we've done. We've yeah. gone old school and and it feels uh, refreshing because yeah. it's it's going against the culture of what's generally happening. Yeah, and the ratings have been, you know, not that we, not that we need to worry too much about it, but the consolidated figures have, uh, you know, have, have been pretty, pretty good. Um, I think, you know, Doctor Who came out second most watched of the day for last week or something with the consolidated figures. I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah, um, I mean, it's not, you know, nothing like the debuts for, you know, for a tenant series, but the way that people watch television has, has changed. So I think yeah. it's, it's do, it's doing well, and no, and you know, and nobody was. 
uh, you know, the expectation was, I think, wasn't that high really amongst amongst some corners of fandom. So it's just it's just it's just all been been lovely. It's great, loving it. And we will continue loving it next week. So we'll wrap up this for now and um, say, stay safe out there in internet world. And uh, we'll be back with more Doctor Who opinions and gossip next week. Run for your life! <laughs>